Thank you very much, everybody, and good morning. Appreciate everybody being up at 8.30 in the morning wow. in Vegas. It's pretty impressive. We're glad to have you here. And sorry for getting started late, and we were told that there isn't anyone immediately following us in the room, so we do have a few extra minutes. So uh, this talk was meant to be very short, 20 minutes or something like that, um, but I think we will have time for questions and engaging, and that'll make it a lot more fun for us as well. So we thank you for being here. I'll introduce myself quickly. Just here, you can drive. drive? Yeah. Um, I'm Sharon Griswold. I'm emergency medicine faculty uh, at Drexel. I had lots of uh, different roles along the way, but get to that on my disclosure slide. So, Julie, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Julie Rice. I am emergency medicine faculty at Johns Hopkins, and I'm the director of the resident uh, simulation education programming there. I'm also about to graduate from the Master's in Medicine and Healthcare Simulation program at Drexel, which Sharon runs, and which is how we uh, became acquainted. So I have nothing to disclose. Uh, I just, uh, really, I have just a non-disclosure agreement with the simulation um, startup company. So uh, it doesn't affect anything in the, in the contributions in the talk, however. Okay, so today we want to, what we really want you guys to do is to walk away with some strategies to engage your advanced emergency medicine learners. And when we say advanced emergency medicine learners, what we're talking about is people that are just getting ready to get into independent practice. These are your PGY3s, your PGY4s, maybe even uh, though your faculty, uh, your advanced learners and those people that are going to be practicing independently. So less the medical students in the PGY1s and 2s, but many of the concepts we talked about are important when you're designing material for them as well. Uh, we're going to be discussing cognitive load theory and also the concepts of signal to noise ratio as important concepts when designing these educational experiences. And hopefully you guys are going to walk away with some strategies of how to engage those advanced learners. So. Uh, this is uh, how, uh, this was me, uh, I don't even think I'm, I count as an intern at this point. This was, I think, during ATLS, I haven't even done a clinical shift. I am super clueless, but I knew that in, uh, you know, four years, something was going to happen here, and I was going to have superpowers. I was going to walk out of my residency program with superpowers, and I just knew that it was going to be pretty complicated, however, however I was going to get there. Now that I'm an educator, I, uh, I, I know that this complicated you know, uh, process is a combination of skills, knowledge, and attitudes that we're teaching our learners. And those are kind of swirled together to make this ability, this superpower ability. But as you can see, it still kind of gets really complicated. As you have your PGY1s and your 2s, your beginner learners, you can teach them basic skills, you know, how to put in the central line, basic knowledge, how to manage that aortic dissection. But then once you start getting into where it all swirls together, again, it gets pretty complicated. So what are, the, what are the challenges? What are these complications for advanced learners? Oh, we're going to skip forward one. So I, when I was thinking about what makes advanced learners challenging, I think about adult learning theory. I love adult learning theory. Adult learners learn what's relevant. They're self-directed, internally motivated, and they bring previous experience to try to solve problems. That's how they learn best. Well, you can see it becomes complicated for these advanced learners because they have a lot of different previous experience. And it's hard to know what previous experience they're actually bringing to the table. Maybe one of your PGY3s hasn't seen an aortic dissection. Maybe they just dodged that bullet uh, and th they don't know that. Or maybe a PGY3 or 4 has seen 10 or 20 of them and making them go through an entire simulation is maybe a waste of time, not only for them, but also for that faculty that spends that hour with them because simulation is a very resource intense uh, way to learn. You also see up here, they learn what is relevant. Well, what's relevant is not only going to be different based on that previous experience, but it also gets really complex. Oh. So what's relevant? What are these skills that are relevant? Skills like task switching, skills like parallel diagnosis, management, and intervention. You know, managing that status epilepticus while also trying to think of what's, what the actual diagnosis is, what the cause of it is. Managing with limited information. This happens to emergency providers all the time. Expanding your situational awareness to manage the entire emergency department and also operating while overwhelmed. Uh, the, in the military, they call this stress inoculation. You gotta learn how to operate while you're stressed out. So these are really complex skills. How are we going to teach these skills? So 
I, I love this graft, uh, and I would add just one thing to what Julie said too. I, um, about five, six years ago, I actually said I could retire when our faculty started doing simulation and like volunteering to be vulnerable and up in front of people. That day has since come and it's gone, and that's, I think it's where we also need to be. Eventually, once we really get to this learning culture, where everybody really is showing up to try to do their best and everyone realizes that there's always more to learn. To me, that's also a concept of the advanced learners that we're talking about. But why, why I love this slide so much is it, you know, it explains everything, right? So uh, on the, the, green, the green is how much more I realize there is to learn. So I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be 52, right? So I, I've had a lot of different jobs, you know, and I just know that I, I know a lot, but I feel like I've forgotten things that I know at least seven times over. So I feel like I knew that at one point in time, but it's gone, and you know, it's gone. I just, I can't remember. Um, so I know that there's so much in the world that I still need to learn, right? So I think I'm definitely, I'm definitely on the green. And I, and I, and I kind of do know what I'm talking about most of the time, and you know, like I love it when my residents say, that's a really good idea, that's what I'm here for, that's what I do. That's the only thing I contribute to this equation. But the most interesting part of this is I think, where, where Julie's spending the vast amount of time in her simulation exercises is that, that young part, right? So all of us know that there's been some time in our lives where you're like, you feel like you don't know anything, right? And then you're like, I feel like I know everything. So that gap and that delta between uh, how much you actually know, how much more you realize there is to learn, and how much you think you know, okay, can be some of the most difficult learners that you have to deal with. Like everybody agree with that? Is that okay? Yeah, right? So, so those are the people that you have to also, I think, get a sense of where they are when you're bringing them into your simulation center. Um, it's the great equalizer though, right? Right? You don't, you don't need to BS me through anything. You gotta show me what you have to do and we're all gonna learn together and we're gonna get better together. So I love this slide. So how do we make our advanced learners better? I think one of the biggest challenges uh, in experiential learning through SIM is we, we set up this great uh, scenario and we have outcomes and we want our learners to get places, right? And then if they don't get there, we're upset, right? So the, the and, and sometimes when we think needs assessment, people can get a little wrapped up in the formality of needs assessment. But to me, this needs assessment is always that formative gap assessment of where your learners are and where you want them to go. And I would say, please keep in mind all the time that you may have, um, your learning objectives that you set out for learners, right? Uh, and part of the success in SIM is making sure that you get them to where they need to be during that experience. Uh, but the other part is there may come a time when you really need to just throw out what you intended and meet the needs of what they have, right? So, so the needs assessment I think is a very iterative process to make sure that you're meeting the needs of those advanced learners. So sometimes, sometimes you need to get them where they need to be. <coughs> Um, but some of the most important things like dealing with, you know, taking near misses, taking those really passionate experiences that your advanced learners have, turning them into sim cases, talking about how other people's experiences um, have really uh, changed, those are some of the things that can really help. Again, theory, I used to get all queasy when we had to talk about theory, about why this explains everything, but the theory of this zone of proximal development is an important concept to keep um, handy when you're talking about advanced learners because um, how advanced are they? Like Julie was saying, you know, well, you're talking about fourth year medical students who they can't grasp this whole big enchilada. You know, you may have come up with this super complicated, crazy case, they're just not gonna be there. So you need to dial it back a little bit. So this zone of proximal development is, a is an educational theory that's been around for a long time. And th the concept really is that, you know, whatever experience you give people, you know, they can only get to where, this, this zone around where they are now. Like, so you have to scaffold and you have to build knowledge and experience. You can't just get someone at the end of the, you know, the finish line in a marathon, you gotta get them through. Um, so just keep that concept in mind. We could go to the next slide. So next year you wanna talk about cognitive load, and I'm sorry we're throwing a lot of theories at you, but I really, really love educational theory, so I'll try to make it exciting. So cognitive load is important to know when you're designing these simulation experiences. Um, how many of you are familiar with cognitive load theory? Oh, a couple people, okay, good, good. So cognitive load theory says that you have a working memory. It's kind of like the processing computing power. And that is informed by environmental sensors.
said that they used to get information on HPV and MRSA and then used to want it. Now it's a whole brain person who wants to get sick. So yeah, the other fine noise is tracking. It'll cognitively overload and they'll forget the information you actually wanted. But advanced learner, you need to be able to manage the spike noise and not get distracted from these older studies that are coming out. So those are a few of the theories and uh, a couple of the nuggets. Uh, I would say um, there are a few things that I, I like to say um, have really changed how I practice with being able to practice with SIM. Again, experiential learning I think is a game changer in healthcare and that uh, you know, we, we are going to be able to make real effective change. I would say um, that practicing the attitude of when you get knocked off kilter, okay? which we call the amygdala hijack, right? This is a real thing, okay? So when you're, ex all those things that you learn, uh, you know, as, as faculty, when I'm, I'm balancing everything, when someone really gets me upset, I'm not thinking clearly, right? So, but there's science behind that, right? There's neuroscience. You are connected to your higher cortex and all these higher thinking powers <laughs> because you have this ability to maintain that connection. What I am sure everyone in this room, at some point in time, whether it's personal or professional, has man has you know you get your amygdala hijacked and you are just so primal for whatever reason. Okay, you go primal. Obviously, you're not taking good care of patients or thinking clearly when you go primal. So, to me, experiencing this in the same in the safe place of a simulation experience. Is a, is a form of stress inoculation that really does help us and prepare us for that next time. I've spent a lot of my time in my career coming up with the knowledge, right? A lot of time on the cord oral case bank, which I gotta be honest, like retrospectively now, we hardly put any attitude or communication type kind of uh, objective into those learning objectives. Like hardly any of them have teamwork and communication in there. I, it, we work on it every single time. It, we never leave a case now without work, working on basically some form of stressing people to this level where they're almost going to lose it, right? Um, so that's the amygdala hijack. And I like this term because whenever someone's pissing me off now, I can just say, you're, you're about ready to hijack my amygdala. <laughs> and then they look at me like, and it's a, it's a better thing than me to say, you're going to piss me off. I like it anyway. Try it if you like it. If you remember nothing else, it's the amygdala hijack. It's about, it's about training us ha how not to go to that dark and primal place, okay? Uh, and all of us can use a little practice with that. Uh, we like bringing this uh, diagram up. This is, I, I, I told Julie, she has to remind me, the Russell Circumplex Theory of Emotion. How many, thank you. I'm very proud of myself. Small wins, celebrating small wins. Uh, how many people have ever seen this kind of diagram before? No? Okay, well, I thought a lot more would. So, yeah. so, so this is like a big educational theory diagram where most educational people would say that in order to learn well, you have to be in this great sweet spot of where you're, you know, activated, where you're on the happy side, you know, like, because because these bad emotions over here, like the frustrated, annoyed, blah, 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 like you don't learn as well when you're in those spots, right? So m many people, many people, many educators in medical education will throw this kind of slide up and say, it's really important for you to be in that target group. We do not believe that at all. That's not our life. It's not what we're training for. You don't get to stay there, right? Period. But being in a safe space while you're trying to learn and being in a safe space when you can be miserable, sad, angry, volatile, bored, whatever, you know, that's really how we learn so that we don't get to those spaces as quickly when we're taking care of patients. So, uh, get this one. I worked hard on this one. <laughs> Amygdala, Amygdala hijack antidotes. That's what we're doing in simulation, okay? Uh, we really have people have these transformational moments, right? They connect dots. Uh, we show people a different way to act and behave in a safe space. So that's what we think the real gold is with their, our advanced 
um, learners, whoever you want to call them. So it really gives people an alternative to status quo. Tips and suggestions, and then happy to take any conversations again. We're not getting kicked out, so we can talk about anything you guys want to talk about that will make it helpful. Don't reinvent the wheel, right? There's plenty of places where you can get access to cases. Um, think about those needs assessments for your learners. What is it that people really want and need to experience in, in, in participating in, in, a, in an experiential learning setting? Um, and have a great time with it. I mean, we get to do a lot of amazing things. Um, <laughs> but um, but um, anyway, so you can always ramp it up by focusing on teamwork and communication. Um, that's always an option. Uh, we talked about a little of those things. So that's that's pretty much what we wanted to share with you. Again, talking about the amygdala hijack, talking about the experiences of the balance of pouring in uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes for your learners. Um, but with that, we're happy to take any discussion. Yes, sir. We can, so, so, so that's a great, great question. Um, there are a lot of residents in this room, so I'm gonna ask them. Do you feel comfortable being <laughs> insulted in sin? Don't tell about my assaulted. Not assaulted, <laughs> insulted. Do you feel comfortable? Yes, no? The, I would agree with you. I would agree with you. So, so we're going to be around Sim Wars tomorrow, right? Where you have this Sim and everybody gets up on stage, right? When I did that as faculty, and I was afraid that I was going to make mistakes in front of my peers, that was terrifying. Okay, uh, I have a um, our associate program director was my resident, then my Sim fellow, then my faculty, my peer, my my. She swears that getting up and doing sim wars was more difficult than her or boards. Again, from that standpoint of, because the residents don't care about making a mistake in front of me, they care about making a mistake in front of their peers. So that is a very real thing. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's really the level of psychological safety. Every session that I start, you know, and people talk about the psychological safety and the pre-vaping and bringing people in. I say, make mistakes, talk to like you're an idiot, like um, uh, I don't care what happens in here, it's all about making sure that you're safer and taking care of real patients. So you make every mistake you possibly can while you're here, so it gives permission. I also make sure that they know I don't know everything. Like, it, they, insulting them, yes, insulting them. I can insult them. Oh, how do I get them there? Oh, we, I can insult them. I can, I can make, I can tear them down in two minutes. So we'll be best practices? Absolutely. No, like we'll, we'll be an obnoxious consultant. We'll get in there. Yeah, not, like, to, not to bring No, never. Yeah, never well, never if that's what you're, like if, if, if I'm practicing being, if I'm practicing, so hypothetically, in a hypothetically situation, right? If you had a bad relationship between your emergency medicine department and your trauma department, and you just internalized a certain person and were that person, I bring that. Like, I'll be that person. I'll make it very real and I will say the things that that person and have them have the opportunity to practice what they would need. And if they do it poorly, they get to practice it again. Yeah. We, uh, we also find that there can be some things like... Say what you said again, sorry. So maybe the surgical attending had it right all along. Uh, no, no, like not when, but so, but there are patients involved, right? There are patients involved when, when, they're, when they're doing it in the clinical world. And, I, and the other thing is, is I, I really think from our, the difference too about uh, my program and, uh, and how I feel like over more than a decade, it has changed things. Our residents give each other feedback and give the attendings feedback much more readily than um, the, like, even the other residents in the program, some, in, the, in the institution kind of are like, you'll say that to your attending? You know, 
Like, and it, and it, doesn't, it comes from a respectful place. It doesn't come from a place of fear or intimidation. It comes from a respectful place. So I think it's a good thing. So I don't think the surgeon, you know, the other thing I tell people is like people behave badly because they have no self-confidence. So you should feel sorry for them and you can help them so, a better way. So not, but the, the times when you guys are most challenges, like in, as a resident, what, what challenges you the most? But that's what takes your cognitive load space, right? And, and so, that, again, that goes back to the theory. But you have to do all those things. And, and really, sometimes when I really want to challenge them, I will bring in standardized patients. I will bring in people that they really don't know to be that. You know, one time I played an attorney. Like, they made a mistake during the case, and then I walked in, like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, I'm going to sue all of you. Who's your boss? You know, I, I. We've had some great actors in our program too, so it helps when you can play the part. So, but but you know, sometimes asking what it is that you feel the most horrified about in the shift, right? That that's what I talk about when I mean a needs assessment. What is it? I ask my residents, you know, what are you comfortable with? What are you most unsettled with? What what what's your biggest gap? What's your biggest delta? And then you figure out ways to work around that. If that makes sense.